Thank you, Lord. Seven perfect time, the perfect time, the perfect time. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for your goodness and your grace. I am humbled and I'm just blasted by your grace. I'm overwhelmed. Father, I just really didn't expect that you had this much in the scripture to keep pouring out. I'm so excited. And I give you thanks for this. And I've helped. I pray, Lord, that you help me to teach and make these teachers. In Jesus' name, amen. Miles Wiley Albright, October 24th, 2022. Bible in the Bar, Hobbs Island Pit Stop, Huntsville, Alabama, 7 p.m. You might want to close that. It's pretty loud. Okay, um, I um, have been stunned by revelation in the last week on two levels, a revelation from the word, <clears throat> but this particular word from the Bible stuns me with its implications for understanding the prophetic, and I don't just mean goofy wild tongue talkers, them too, but you know, everybody believes that they're they're being led by the Spirit. Hopefully, a lot of a lot of unbelievers believe they're they're looking for divine circumstances. And this is be a uh, this will be about being led by the Lord and about hearing from God and not missing. So it's about that. It's also about something else that happened. Parallel, as far as I'm concerned, completely separate, probably parallel to this. But I wrote a book called Tell Two Hearts. Uh, wrote it several years ago, uh, I believe 20 years ago. It was finally published about seven or eight years ago. And I thought I was real clear on. I thought I had all the nuggets out of chapter first Samuel chapter thirteen through twenty six, but I didn't. Uh, starting on September the third of twenty twenty two, the Lord has been to open up, especially through my favorite chapter, which I thought I knew best of all, first Samuel fourteen. He's began to open up the rest of Scripture, and what I have to share with you tonight will get to be very practical. Practical for just because you, if you want to know God or if you want to know the voice of God, you know, it's, it's not like you need to learn the voice of God like you, you know, learn French or you learn how to fish for your own selfish interest. We need to, to know God because we love him and we want to hear him accurately and obey him fully. be guided by his eye. But there are, 1 Samuel 14, the Ark of the Covenant makes an appearance in 1 Samuel 14. And it's kind of a sad story. But the Lord began to show me the 30,000 foot view of this thing. But 1 Samuel 4 also has a parallel appearance of the Ark of the Covenant. And, you know, I'm all about First Samuel, but I, I really didn't see how much Judges, particularly Judges chapter 20, the next to last chapter of Judges. But this is a prequel. It's The Ark of the Covenant makes an appearance here. And in all three places, so to speak, people are inquiring of the Lord. This middle one in a different way. <clears throat> but they're inquiring of the Lord and they're wanting to hear from the Lord and because of the corruption of their own motives and their own hearts, you can't do Yahweh like that. You can't use Yahweh. And 
if this stone falls on you, you'll be ground to powder. If you fall on this stone, he will break you, but he'll put you back together in a wonderful way. You have to humble yourself completely and realize you're not talking about some little god like Dagon or Satan or Beelzebub. It's not some little entity. We're talking about the person who created time and space, who is in the future and the past, who holds everything in his hand. He can't be manipulated. He's also extremely holy, extremely pure. And if you come with corruption in your heart, you're going to hit that rock. You're going to hit it hard. You're going to be judged by your own heart when you hit the holy and perfect God. And how that happens in Judges 20 in particular, in 1 Samuel 4 and 14, is a stunner to me. Uh, like I say, I thought I knew this stuff. In fact, hold on. In fact, Judges 19, 20, and 21, the last three chapters, was kind of the major deal, major understanding for us in 2019. And I thought I had a, a full understanding of those three chapters because what he did open up, opening it up in a magnificent way. But now I understand that I didn't, I was just scratching the surface. And so what we're, what I've got tonight is obviously it's a board full. You know, I don't know why I can't get a big enough board. <laughs> Thanks for the board. Thank you for the board. I mean, I've been, I've, so I've taught a lot of times using a board that I carried in the trunk of my car that, you know, that big, <clears throat> I'm very thankful for this, but the Lord showed us himself in a special way in Judges chapter 20. And then a friend posted a, a, a picture of a sign somebody had made and put on the side of the road, but like he'd done it with chalk or something. But that sign said, it's hard to hear God's voice when you've already decided what you want him to say. That's profound, period. But it's also, it's especially profound with regard to these three chapters, in particular, chapter 20. And I've taught so much on chapter 4 and especially 14 that I'm going to concentrate on Judges 20. And if you don't, if you're not familiar with <laughs> Judges 4 and, and I mean, it's the first time you're 4 and 14, it's going to be hard for you to get what I'm saying. It just is. There are some rooms you can only enter after you're familiar with You've passed through other rooms and seen the and seen the um, interior decoration of those rooms. But in chapter nineteen, it, it's one of these chapters that when you read it, you hold your you hold your nose because it is so offensive to all of us. And that in itself is a word. And chapter twenty is a recap, a whole lot of chapter nineteen. But then there's a reaction in chapter 20 to what happened in chapter 19 that shows the righteous, it's a relatively righteous, and their errors and how we can make those errors in our lives. But in chapter 19, to kind of recap a little bit, is it's toward the end of the book of Judges. Judges is really a pathetic book about all the corruption and stuff in it because all the corruption and stuff in it. But Judges 19 talks about an unnamed Levite from the hill country of Ephraim who has a concubine, which probably means, you know, she's a second wife. And uh, she's from Bethlehem, which is south, a little south of Jerusalem. Uh, this is a long time before David and certainly a long time before Jesus. Bethlehem didn't quite have the reputation it has had later. It wasn't the house of David yet. But she was from there, and so she decides she doesn't like being married to this Levite, and so she runs home. 
she goes back to uh, her father and her husband, this Levite, makes a trip, takes two donkeys and a servant, goes down. She's at her father's house. And the implication is that the, he is welcomed by his father-in-law so much so that he keeps saying, stay another day, stay another day, eat, drink, eat, drink, eat, drink. They're probably drinking wine. And it's influencing his judgment. And again, this is a Levite. This is supposed to be the best of the best, the ones who just instruct everybody else. That's their calling. And show Israel the ways of God. But we're at the end of the really corrupt book, the book of Judges. So finally, four and a half days into visiting with his father-in-law, where his concubine is staying, he decides in the middle of the day, I got to get out of here. I'm never going to go home. He's probably a little, little buzzed. Probably is making some bad decisions. He leaves in the middle of the day, which is not a good idea. But he leaves in the middle of the day, and he don't really, doesn't really know where he's going. And he and his concubine and his servant head out. And at that time, Jerusalem is held by the Jebusites, and it's not an Israelite city. It's supposed to be, but they never had really taken it. Until the time of David, it was never really taken. So anyway, it's just another place with Gentiles in it. And so the servant says, why don't we go into Jerusalem? And the Levite says, no, 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 no. We don't need to go to where there's uh, uh, unbelievers. We'll go to a city of Israelites. And they stop at a Benjamite city, the territory of Benjamin, a place called Gibeah. And <clears throat> they don't have any reservations at a hotel or anything. They don't really know much about the town. But they stop in the city square. Uh, an, uh, an old man who is a farmer comes in from the field, having worked all day and asks them about their situation. And he acts kind of like Lot does when the two angels walk into Sodom and he realizes that they're in great danger if they stay in this city because this city is so wicked, so evil. There, there are apparently gangs of male homosexuals that are predators and engage in extreme rape. So it's an extremely corrupt city. And, you know, according to Romans 1, those who approve such things or even permit such things participate in their deeds and are as guilty. So the, the, the city is not doing anything about these wicked, wicked people. But, but this old man says, I'm going to do something. He says, come into my house, shut the door. I'll even feed you. I don't want to see what's liable to happen to you, liable to happen to you, or liable, as we say in Alabama, liable to happen to you. And so they come into his house, but just like in in Sodom in Genesis 19, this is Judges 19, and there's a message there. They uh, the the homosexual people and demand that the new man, the Levite, this corrupt preacher, be thrown out to them so that they can rape him, a gang rape him. I mean, it doesn't smell very good. But the worst part is the host, the man who owns the house, offers them his virgin daughter and this Levite's concubine. You know, two women, which was what Lot tried to offer to the Sodomites. You know, second verse, same as the first. Pretty horrible. Ultimately, the Levite pushes his concubine that he'd just gotten from her father's house five days before, well, one day before, but he'd been in her father's house for five days. He throws her to the wolves, literally. Benjamin is called a wolf. He throws her to the wolves. They rape her to death. She dies on the threshold of the door, apparently of little consequence to her husband because he opens the door, gets dressed the next morning, opens the door and says, come on, let's go showing no regard for her, not even realizing that she is dead. It's about as ugly as it gets. Realizes she's dead, puts her corpse on his donkey, and goes. He doesn't cut her up right there. He goes, uh, implication is, to the house of Yahweh, which is Shiloh, which is in the hill country of Ephraim, which is where he's 
from. He's a Levite. And instead of cutting up animals, it's as horrible as it gets. This is like a Halloween word. He chops her up into 12 pieces and sends her body parts all the way around to all the regions of Israel and says, what, what are y'all going to do about this? Well, Israel turns out in chapter 20. So we finally get to chapter 20. Israel turns out they all assemble. They've got 400,000 warriors. They're at a place called Mitzpah. And they say, what are we going to do? And they don't inquire of the Lord. And they hear the story of the Levite. And he does, he twists the story a little bit. He doesn't tell them about his corruption. But really, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see how ugly this is. That he's alive and she's dead. And that he fed her to the wolves. And he is corrupt almost as much, maybe as much as those who killed her because he turned her over to them. That's the reality. That's what anybody knows that sees this. An unbeliever can tell that. That was an obvious circumstance that those who are listening at all, the true light that gives light to every man was coming in the world. That's John 1, 9. That means that God talks to everybody about the truth all the time. Romans 1 says that. Psalm 19 says that. Everybody knows truth when they see it. <clears throat> and really, Israel knew they were seeing their own corruption. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Benjamin was horrible. But Israel as a nation was horrible in that their preachers were this kind of complicit murderers. And so they, instead of dealing with that, they say, well, Benjamin's so bad, but they're dealing with their own sin. They're ignoring their own sin. And they're trying to deal with somebody else's. They're trying to deal with the Benjamite sin. Yes, I believe that the homosexual sin is bringing judgment quickly on the United States of America. But really, really, that homosexual sin is the child of the corruption. If statistics say half of pastors are addicted to pornography. Goodness. Goodness, goodness. On, on the way here, I heard on the news that a local pastor had been arrested for three counts of using a seven-year-old girl, a local pastor, conservative denomination. Yes, Homosexuality is a pinnacle thing. The sins of, of the Amorites reach their fulfillment at a point. But we would need to deal. Judgment begins with a household of faith first. But these guys don't ask God. These guys don't repent of the wickedness of Israel. Every man is doing what is right in his own eyes. And so they get madder and madder and madder. And a oath is sworn, a curse is sworn here, but we don't find out about it until after the battle's over, which is exactly what happened in 1 Samuel 14. In 1 Samuel 14, there's a, there's a battle going on, and we don't find out until after the battle that a curse had been sworn, an oath had been sworn, invoking death, before the battle started. In fact, let me see if I can try to, if, if, if you, you got to really know this scripture for this to uh, mean anything to you. But in Judges chapter 20, the ark is used in this situation. They're going to inquire of the Lord at the ark. It says at Bethel, but it, it, Bethel is the house of God. And that's supposed to be translated house of God. King James got that one right. <laughs> they translated it house of God and it's not Bethel, the place it's the house of God because they're at shallow where the ark is. The, they go to the ark to inquire of the Lord <clears throat> in chapter four. 
<clears throat> they've been defeated by the Philistines, so they try to carry the ark. The Philistines carry it. I mean, the priests carry it, but they go into battle and get their they lose thirty thousand <clears throat> dead. And then in chapter fourteen, there's a battle that's imminent, and Saul has just been rebuked in chapter thirteen. <clears throat> and in order to try to <clears throat> stay increase his reputation. He brings the ark with him as staging. He's going to, he's not going to inquire of the Lord as long as it looks like if the Lord tells me to attack, I, I'm going to have to have faith to actually obey that because I've got 600 trembling men and they've got 3,000 chariots. And so I don't want to, I don't want him to tell me, I don't trust him. So he wouldn't inquire of the Lord through the Urim and Thummim that was in the ephod, which was a pocket that the high priest had in their garment. But he brings the Ark of the Covenant so that he can look spiritual, he can look priestly, which is what he was rebuked for doing in chapter 13. He is not repenting of what he did in chapter 13. He's actually doing it again. And he's doing it both times because he fears what the men think. He got rebuked for fearing men in front of the men. So instead of repenting, he fears men more. And he brings the Ark of the Covenant so that if some situation comes up and and the Philistines, it looks like we might defeat them. I'll ask the God if we should attack, but that's not how this thing works. It's going, you, you can't get the Ark of the Covenant and ask God if I should attack when it looks like it's a good opportunity. You have to ask him when it's going to cost you something. That is the very nature of Yahweh. That is the nature of faith. That is the nature of faithfulness. That is the nature of love. So, It was used in, in Judges chapter 20. We're going to say it was used in presumption and God humbled Israel and Benjamin. It was used in presumption when they, in chapter 4 of 1 Samuel, and they went into battle and, of course, 30,000 were killed. They were very humbled. The ark of the God was, cap of God, God was captured and the, the high priest kicked over dead. He was so shocked. It was so horrible. They go, the glory of God has departed. It, the ark went off into Philistine country. But when it got there, it humbled the Philistines because they thought they could use it as a trophy. And God started dealing with the, he humbled the Philistines and Israel there. Well, over here, when Saul tried to use the ark to make, him, make himself look good, so, you know, the, because of Jonathan's courage and faith, there's an earthquake. The Philistines start fainting, hitting each other, running away. And so he goes to inquire of the Lord, shall I attack? But obviously the Lord has said by divine circumstances to attack, but he's asking to look good and to look priestly. And God, of course, will not answer. And he doesn't answer him. So he looks bad because he's got the Ark of the, God, of the Covenant and he's got the high priest with the Urim through him and God won't answer him. So he says, withdraw your hand. And he, and he pronounces this curse on anyone who eats food before the day is over. Well, in Judges chapter 20, I know I'm covering a lot, but I can't help it. I didn't design this thing. This is a big piece of steak. Try to cut up these in little pieces and swallow this. But in Judges chapter 20, they're mad at how evil the, the Benjamites are, and they swear a curse before the battle, but they don't tell us till after the battle, just like in the other chapter, 1 Samuel 14. It doesn't tell us that they had sworn an oath, cursed be any man who gives his daughter to a Benjamite. So one's about giving a daughter to a Benjamite, and the other one's about eating food. There's a parallel there. This is incredible. So there's in their anger, they swear this oath, and they get together, and they send a word. Uh, chapter This is chapter 20, verse 12. The tribes of Israel sent men throughout the tribe of Benjamin, saying, What about this awful crime that was committed among you? Now surrender these wicked men of Gibeah, so that we may put them to death and purge the evil from among Israel. But the Benjamites would not listen to their fellow Israelites. From their towns, they came together at Gibeah to fight against the Israelites. At once, the Benjamites mobilized 26,000 swordsmen from their towns, in addition to 700 chosen men from those living in Gibeah, probably a lot of homosexuals among those. Among the, all these soldiers, there were 700 chosen men who was left-handed and who could sling a stone at a hair and not miss. Israel, apart from Benjamin, mustered 400,000 swordsmen all of them fighting men so they're outnumbered they got them outnumbered 20 to 1 they got them outnumbered israel has 
the Benjamites outnumbered in the same proportion just about as the Philistines have Saul and his army outnumbered. But these Benjamites in their carnality are ready to fight and God is going to see to it that the Benjamites win because judgment begins with a household of faith and Israel, as bad as they are, is better than Benjamin. That doesn't mean they're going to win. That means they're going to lose. That means they're going to be they're going to judge so they can actually begin a certain amount of repentance. So we go ahead and read this story here down a little farther. So Israel, apart from Benjamin, mustered four hundred thousand men. Okay, verse eighteen. The Israelites went up to Beth El, actually house of God. That's what the King James says, and it that's that's what Beth El means. And they inquired of God. That means they went to Shiloh. That's where the tabernacle was and the Ark of the Covenant was and the high priest was, the high priest named Phineas. He's not mentioned yet. He will be later. They said, who of us shall go first to fight against the Benjamites? Hear this. It's hard to hear God's voice when you've already decided what you want him to say. They did not ask God if they should attack Benjamin. They said, who shall go first? You better be careful when you've already decided what God's supposed to say. Because I'm going to tell you, particularly if you're prophetic, or even if you're not, everybody in a way looks for fleeces. Everybody in a way looks for hints. Everybody in a way kind of watches how karma plays out. Everybody watches for that kind of stuff. But if, you're, if your heart is corrupt, you will misinterpret what God is saying. And these people did. Notice, this is one time when knowing what the Hebrew is, is absolutely, I, I can't think of a, I've studied so many hours. And I've studied the, this Hebrew and stuff so many hours, but I've never seen a place where it was more essential to know what the Hebrews is actually saying. They say, who shall go first to fight against the Benjamites when, when they, and they're not asking if they should go fight. And the Lord replied, and, and, and sometimes there are words that are not in the Hebrew, there, but they're, they're put it there to make it seem like it makes more sense. It says Judah shall go first in the NIV, but the word go is not in the Hebrew. All it says is, Judah is first. Now, that's a word from God. And if you've already decided that you're supposed to go to the battle and you're asking God who shall go first, God may very well give you a cryptic answer that will judge your carnality. Judah is first. Judah is supposed to be, Judah is supposed to be the, the source of the first king. But partly because of what's going on here, he won't be. They'll get into the current carnality and he won't be first but judah is first but they interpret that to mean god approves of us going into battle and even gives a strategy that judah should go first but that was presumption just like saul was in presumption when he thought he could manip ask god inquire of the lord and inquire of the lord and and and, and look good for the soldiers and and in chapter 4, they, they, they were in presumption when they thought well, they can carry the Ark of the Covenant into battle and God will have to show up. Presumption will get you killed when you get close enough to God. And that's a good thing, believe it or not. But it says Judah is first. It doesn't really say Judah shall go first because go is not there. But they interpret according to their own lust and their preconception and their pride and their presumption. So the next morning, the Israelites got up and pitched camp near Gibeah. They pitched camp. That's important. The men of Israel went out to fight the Benjamites and took up battle positions against them at Gibeah. The Benjamites came out of Gibeah and cut down 22,000 Israelites on the battlefield that day. Hideous. They got a word from God. But they didn't get a word from God. They misinterpreted a word from God. But they don't know it yet. But the men of Israel encouraged one another again and took up their positions where they had stationed themselves the first day. In other words, they're still, they got thousands of people out there still ready to, to, to resume the battle against Benjamin. Notice that. 
They took up their positions where they'd stationed themselves the first day. The Israelites went up and wept before them. So there's some of them, most of them is there in position, ready to fight Benjamin again. But some of them goes to Shiloh to seek the Lord. The Israelites went up and wept before the Lord until evening, and they inquired of the Lord, and they said, Shall we go up again to battle against the Benjamites? Our brothers, or our brother, it's literally a, a collective singular, our brother, and but yet they've already decided that they're supposed to. They're not broken. They're not repentant. They've still got their their p men in position on the field. They're presuming that they're doing the right thing because they presumed wrong earlier. And they weep and wail and weep and wail, but they're not broken and they're not repentant. And this is what is so crucial. Now, got to pause here. We had to understand 1 Samuel 14, in particular, this word here, this Allah word, we had to understand that before we could understand this. Allah word. And this is a mystery. This is awesome. In chapter 14. Okay, let me back up again. First Samuel is about who hears from God. And yes, the Urim and Thummim is there. And David, when he gets it, he inquires the Lord in Urim and Thummim, and God gives very specific direction. But David and 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 Hannah and Abigail and and Jonathan in particular, they see divine circumstances that are the Urim and Thummim of divine circumstances. That reminds me, I didn't uh, put as you're right. This is supposed to have two quotes. It just kind of came to me. The Urim and Thummim is how you hear from God. Supposedly, these, these little rocks or stones or whatever it was in the, in, in the uh, effort of the high priest. But this is written for us who do not have a Urim and Thummim in the natural. We have the heart of God and even Jonathan and Abigail and Hannah and David could see what God was saying if their heart was after him. Jonathan looks at his father and 600 men trembling and they won't attack, and they won't do anything, and they won't even ask God should they do anything. And so he sees that divine circumstance, and that is for him a Urim and Thummim. And he goes out and says to his armor bearer, says, come on, let's show ourselves. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving us by many of our few. And, and they show themselves to the Philistines, and he says, if they say, come up to us, we'll know God is saying, attack them. Now understand. Come up is the word Allah. This is so important, but it also means to offer an offering. When Abraham, in chapter 22 of Genesis, is there with Isaac, and instead of offering Isaac, he offers a burnt offering of a, of a ram. That is the word, the Allah. It goes it means to go up. The, the offer you burn the sacrifice. The smoke goes up and is Allah to the Lord. But it's also the word like when you go up to Jerusalem or you go up to Shiloh to go to a place. So it can have a double meaning. And so you better be hearing God because if in your lust you are prejudiced by what you already want him to say because of your stupidity, your failure to recognize your own sin, then you may very well miss God. And they say, who shall go up against, uh, shall we go up? And the word is yasa. Shall we go up is the word yasa. But the Lord doesn't say yasa. He says, literally, he says, Allah to him. Them there is not correct. They refer to the tribes as, you know, like we say, Stand beside her and guide her through the night with a light from above. You know, it's a, it is a collective singular. We refer to America as a her. But really, we mean all the Americans. Well, they refer to Benjamin as a him. And so that, shall we go up against him? And the Lord says, Allah to him. Allah to him. Now, if you've already decided 
that you want to go fight and you don't want to deal with the nasty nasty of my own sin and the Levite sin, but you just want to go fight because their their sin's worse than our sin. And you hear a lot to him, you better be paying attention. Because it also means offer a sacrifice to him. So in a way, this is about pronouns. This is about getting the pronouns right, understanding the pronouns. Allah to him. And they misunderstood. They thought it meant God is telling us to do what we wanted to do because we left our men in the field. And so we're going to go fight them. Even though he didn't answer us, we said, shall we go up and use the word Yasa? He didn't say Yasa. He said, Allah to him. And I'm telling you, I'll show you as we get a lot one down here. He wasn't saying go to battle. He was saying, offer a burnt offering, sacred worship me. Back up. Back up. But they couldn't hear that. Then the Israelites drew near to Benjamin the second day. And this time when the Benjamites came out from Gibeah to oppose them, they cut down another 18,000 soldiers, all of them armed with swords. Okay, so now they've thought they've heard from God twice, and they've lost 40,000 men. And a lot of times, your faith is, will be tested because you think you've heard from God, and then God didn't come through. And you may have suffered greatly. Now, will you embrace the cross and trust the Lord and know that it's never his fault. If there's a fault, it's with you. So notice this. Notice this paragraph carefully. Then the Israelites and all the people went up to Bethel, where they sat weeping before the Lord. Notice it says all of them went. They, they did not leave people out there stationed out there like, you know, we're, we know we're fixing to attack them again. They don't realize that they've done messed up and, twice they've been in presumption twice it's cost them forty thousand graves that's like almost like shallow the battle of shallow it's hideous dead everywhere so they completely leave the battlefield because they realize they've messed up somehow these people are not capable of blaming god that's just not their theology that's how that's us in the 21st century and our presumption, we may blame God. They didn't. They knew better. So the Israelites, all the people, that's in the Bible. That's what it's there for. They all come out of the battlefield. They went up to Be actually house of God, Beth El, as Shiloh. And there they sat weeping before the Lord. They fasted. That's important. Not just because fasting is important, but it's, fa it's important for what is said here. They fasted that day until evening and presented burnt offerings. Okay, presented is Allah. Allah. And that's the verb to offer up an offering. They Allah, Ola. Ola is the burnt offering itself. It's a slightly different, one letter different in the Hebrew. They offered an offering but not just any offering this is a burnt offering and fellowship offerings to Yahweh notice this a fellowship offering typically what you do you just burn a small part of it and most you take most of it and the family eats it before the Lord and it's kind of like a party with God but that's not what they're doing here because they're fasting and they're they're so broken, they're so repentant that they're allying a burn offering, which is what they're supposed to do to start with, but they're also allying a fellowship offering. They're burning all of it. They're not presuming anymore. He said a lot to him, and they're going, uh-oh. We messed up. Let's go a lot to him. And they went and a lot to him. They went back to Shiloh, brought everybody out of the field. No more presuming we're going into battle. No more presuming anything. Let's weep. 
Lutz fast. We got 40,000 dead. We're a little slow on the uptake, but maybe on the third time, we can get our hearts pure enough. They're weeping. They're fasting. They're a lying. A burn offering and even a lying fellowship offering. To the Lord. And the Israelites inquired of the Lord. So now they're in a place to actually hear from God. And they were not to this point. You read this chapter and it's like, what in the world is going on here? I've read this and said, well, I always thought where God guides, he provides. You know what? He does. It didn't look like he was providing. Well, he wasn't because he didn't guide them. They were hearing according to their own preconceptions, their own presumption. And the Israelites inquired of the Lord. In those days, this is so neat, the Ark of the Covenant of God was there, there at Shiloh, there at the house of God, the tabernacle. In those days, the Ark of the Covenant of God was there with Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, ministering before it. Can't go into it, but the guy had to be 400 years old. God had made a covenant of peace with him. He lived all the way through part of the, de well, most of the desert, all of Joshua, and here at the end of the book of Joshua, that's 410 year, years long. That's another story. But Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, was ministering before it, and they asked, shall we go up, and they, and again, the word is Yasa, because they don't want to misunderstand again. They don't want to, they don't want to say Allah, they want, to, they want to get a very specific word. Shall we, Yasa, go up again to battle with Benjamin, our brother, or him, our brother, ah, or not? The Lord, yes, Yahweh, responded, and he is not embarrassed. He is Yahweh. He is not nervous about what's happened before. He doesn't feel guilty. And he says Allah again. In a sense, he's saying, offer yourselves as an offering to me. But he goes on to say, Allah, but for tomorrow I will give them into your hands. Okay, you see what I'm saying? He's God. He's not bashful. He doesn't have, a, he's not guilt, don't feel guilty about the 40,000 dead. It's all on them. And he's not going to say Yasa. He's going to say Allah. But then he's going to say, but you're going to win tomorrow. And he hadn't said that before. He hadn't told them they were going to win. He would said, Judah is first. He didn't say Judah goes first. He said, Judah is first. And then he says, Allah to him. You better be careful. If your heart's not pure, you will misinterpret a dream, a vision, a circumstance, a, a word, a prophetic word through somebody, or somebody telling you, hey, you're supposed to be pastor at so-and-so church. Your desire, if your desire is to go there and look better and make more money or whatever, be careful. You will miss God if your heart is corrupt. Happens all the time. How much do you want to present yourself as an offering to God? How much do you want to embrace the cross for God? That's exactly what Jonathan did. He offered himself as an offering. That was a that was suicide to climb that cliff in front of his armor bearer with a staff in his hand and 20 guys at the top armed to the teeth. He offered himself an offering on the side of that cliff. Now, the, the, the Israelites in their anger, when they were about to do stupid because they were so mad about the Benjamites, they, they uttered this curse about not giving their daughters, which caused problems later. Okay? They had to deal with that. That's, that's another story. I can't co cover the whole thing tonight. But again, Saul, in order to look good, said, Cursed be any man. Because see, he had been just embarrassed because God wouldn't speak to him to the, the, the Urim and Thummim standing in front of the Ark of the Covenant. He'd set it up to look good, but it looked worse. And he said, Cursed be any man who eats bread today. That brought trouble. It weakened the men and it endangered his son. Death was on and judges was on the cowards because they said there was a second curse besides that don't give your daughters away 
They uttered a curse and said, Cursed be any man who does not join us in fighting this battle. And they realized that nobody from Jabesh Gilead had joined them. So that meant that everybody in Jabesh Gilead had to die, but they spared 400 virgins. But there was a curse of death on the cowards, those who wouldn't fight. Over here, there was a curse of death on the courageous because those who were really brave were already out there fighting before Saul and his men ever even start. But that put him under the curse because he ate honey as he was running along with the Spirit of God on him so strong that the Philistines were falling before him. Not understanding Allah was pivotal with, with uh, in, in chapter 20. When they said Allah to him, they thought it meant one thing and it meant something else. Over here, Jonathan knew what he, when he said, uh, if they say Allah to him, come up to us, that'll be God saying, attack them. And so the Philistines said, come up to us. And the Philistines didn't realize that they were giving them a word from God. And they were telling them, you can offer us yourself as a sacrifice to me. And I'm going to honor it because I just gave you a sign. So really, the Philistines didn't understand. They misunderstood the Allah thing. Look at that. Presumptive boldness brought death over here. They were presumptuous, and then 40,000 people died. Over here, presumptuous faith. There was, was there such a thing as presumptuous faith in the part of Jonathan that brought life for the good guys, rescued Israel. Try to understand this. This is so important. First Samuel is about who hears from God, and Judges 20 is the perfect prequel. Do you understand? David is in the back of a cave, and he sees Saul using the bathroom in front of him, squatted down in front of him, facing outside, and he, he, and he realizes that that's a Urim thummim of divine circumstance. I just invented a new term. That's a Urim thummim of divine circumstance where the, I'm supposed to show mercy to this man and confront his insanity, and that's what he did. He kept seeing situations. He saw that Saul was out there in the middle of 3,000 men coming against him, and he's lying down to go to sleep, and he realizes he's been set up, and the, the Lord, it didn't, it didn't say he inquired of the Lord. It didn't say he even prayed. He saw by a pure heart the Urim and Thummim of divine circumstance. You will too if your heart is willing to be an offering, a burnt offering, an Allah to the Lord. David went out and got that, got, and while everybody was asleep, went and got Saul's spear and water jug from the, exactly the middle of 3,000 snoring soldiers and brought them back. He interpreted the mind of God by seeing divine circumstances. Abigail heard that her husband had sworn an oath to go kill. Uh, no, she heard that her husband had, re had rebuked David's men. And she realized this is not good because she really knew what was going on with David, that David was fleeing from pillar to post. Saul was giving him a hard time. She knew all of that. And this was not a good time for her. My, my drunk, probably drunk husband, to spurn David's 10 young men. And so she doesn't wait for a word from God. Let him say she prayed. She grabs a bunch of food and she heads for David. She hears from God on the way. Hannah even discerned a circumstance and knew she was, God had set her up to have a prayer answered, even through a corrupt high priest. But she saw what God was doing. There's a corrupt high priest involved. Jonathan was in, had a corrupt king involved, but they still saw what God was doing in the middle of that. You need, you don't need a Urim and Thummim. You don't need two marbles. You don't need two rocks. You need a heart that's so pure that you want to do what God wants you to do. And you won't be in presumption, especially anger and judgment about somebody else's sin. Did you get your heart clean? And then you say, Lord, I'll do whatever you tell me to do, even if it kills me, even if it costs me my life. I embrace the cross. I Allah to you. So that's, this is, I've, I've, I've invented this term, Urim and Thummim of divine circumstance. They, the Israelites, when they, when, they, when they saw how corrupt the, the, their Levite was and what happened with this, this concubine, they should have said, look, we need to repent. They missed that. But over here, it's interesting. In this middle circumstance, 
even the priests of the Philistines recognized the divine circumstance when their God fell before the Ark of the Covenant twice, and then everybody started getting hemorrhoids and rats, and death was coming everywhere the Ark was, and they said, okay, this is probably not good, and this is probably Yahweh, but just to be sure, uh, we'll put uh, this ark on a, on a wagon and put two cows that's just calved and pin up their baby calves and hook them to yokes. And if that, in other words, they saw the circuit divine circumstances. They had used the Urim and Thummim, so to speak, of divine circumstances. They're a little slow on the uptake, but they did finally get it. Okay? Over here, Jonathan looks and sees that it's not supposed to be Israel trembling before the Philistines and his God and his, and his, his father, the king, standing there with the Urim and Thummim won't do anything, and he moves. So he that's his Urim and Thummim. Okay. All right. This is incredibly important. We have, my wife had a vision last night. I had a dream last night. I tremble. I tremble in these circumstances. I guess you don't. I'm probably, I mean, maybe you do tremble, but I don't, it's not common, I don't guess, to have a vision and a dream in 24 hours. It's getting so that they're more and more and more frequent with us. I know the corruption, the temptations in my own heart. I know the things I have to deal with my own flesh. And it scares me to get a dream lest I fall on my own sword. I want to hear from God, and I don't care how much it costs me. I want to Allah. Okay? Most of you are used to, to, trying, to trying to see other, hear from the Lord in other ways. You can. But that sin that you think that he, well, he knows about it, but it's not a big deal. That will keep you from hearing God. Deal with it. Or face the consequences. You can't play with Yahweh. Now. Okay. As much as this is, I am amazed. We've gone 52 or 3 minutes. But we had something else happen. And this is not going to be easy for me to say. If, if you're tired, turn off the video and come back and listen to this later. But I got an amazing word from God. And, and you know, God does this. He embarrasses me with the prophetic stuff he gives me because this is, seems crazy. But this is what I call the most holy Bible, okay? I've had 123 copies at this at my 123rd copy is out there in the back seat of my car. I, I give them or sell them to people who need them, people who are hungry for God and don't realize that there's another level they can go to if they can read and see how these words actually connect. I'm not trying to be a messianic or anything like that. It's just a reality. I wouldn't have got what I got tonight without this Hebrew Greek keyword study Bible with the numbers, but the words that tie all these things together. I would not have known about Allah. I would have been confused about what happened those three times they inquired of the Lord in, in Judges. I was confused. But I understand how, big time. But, a step and apart from how practical a tool it is, the Lord does the craziest things with me, with this Bible, with pages and stuff on it. Now, for me, to express what's happened, and it's, this is a practical value, it's about Donald Trump. Something happened with regard to Donald Trump two years ago, but then it happened on another level last Wednesday, the, uh, was that the 19th, I think. I think it was the 19th of October. I had an encounter. All right, so i got to tell you the first story before I can tell you the second story about Donald Trump. And I, I, I don't like having to humble myself and show you this kind of stuff. But the Lord two years ago 
two or three years ago, while Trump was president, the Lord spoke to me and said, Trump is a TR ump. He is a TR ump. TR is Teddy Roosevelt. He was known as TR, like, like Kennedy was known as JFK. When TR was president, he was known as TR. That's a big deal. A barber even had a vision of that several years ago, New Year's Eve. And it's about Teddy Roosevelt. And, and I had two people tell me yesterday, you know you look like Teddy Roosevelt? <laughs> it happens all the time. I had a 10-year-old boy walk up to me. I said, did you, mister, did you know you look like Teddy Roosevelt? Anyway, he, Trump is a TR ump, okay? And what the Holy Spirit said, I knew about the TR. Was like, both TR, Teddy Roosevelt, and Trump are, were big mouth, rich New Yorkers that changed the presidency. Bull in a China shop, both cases. And I love, I love Teddy Roosevelt. I got three of his pictures hanging in my home, okay? So anyway, but they, were, they had a lot in common. But, but Trump was a TR ump, and his extreme sovereignty. The man has the name Trump spelled T-R ump. And he told me, he said, you remember that verse, Colossians 3.15, where it says, uh, where it says, uh, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. And I, I remember I heard somebody say maybe 30 or 40 years ago, probably on the radio, probably it was Chuck Swindoll or somebody, that the word rule there is this unusual word that means umpire. Ump. It means umpire. Colossians 3.15, that word means umpire. Well, now, you, to understand what I'm saying, you got to understand the nature, not just the spiritual nature, but the, the physical nature of this, of this uh, most holy Bible, this Hebrew Greek keyword study Bible. It has the key words have numbers by them. The most important words have dark numbers by them. The less important words have like numbers, and the even less important words have no numbers beside them. Okay, you got that? Okay, the, the dark numbers take you back to a lexicon in the back of the book, Hebrew and a Greek lexicon, depending on if you're Old or New Testament, and it gives you a whole lot of information. But the most important words are in the lexicon, and they're keyed there by the dark numbers. The light numbers take you back to the dictionary. All of the Hebrew and all of the Greek numbers are in the Hebrew, in the dictionary, but they're only small definitions. It's not doesn't help you very much, just a little bit, but doesn't help you very much. But then there are words, many words that don't have any numbers by them. So I go over to Colossians three fifteen. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, and I say, oh, well, rule does not have a number by it. So it's one of the least important words in the Bible. But fortunately by God's provision, I have an exhaustive concordance. It's this thick. It's three and a half inches thick. It's this big. And every word that's in the NIV is in there. And you can look up. See, this is not Strong's numbers. This is Goodrick Kohlenberger numbers. They had to make a new numbering system when they made the NIV because Strong's is based on the words in the King James. So they had to do a whole new thing again. And this Goodrick Kohlenberger exhaustive concordance is this big. I look up the word rule in it. And in Colossians 3.15, it is the word number, words numbered. All the words are numbered. It's number 1093, okay? And it says its name is Brebeo. It's a Greek word, Brebeo. And it's only, it says it's only in the Bible one time. Well, guess what? Yeah, I know where that is. It's Colossians 3.15. It's only in the Bible one time, Brebeo, and it's number 1093. And I look in my dictionary, of course, all the words, like I say, will be in the little dictionary. And it's got a little short definition. It just says to rule there, which doesn't help me very much. And it's nothing about ump -ire. But I know the Holy Spirit is saying Trump is a TR ump. And, and obviously this, this word rebeo can't be in the lexicon because that's only for dark numbered words the most important words that stay in the bible a lot if it's in the lexicon without the one time it's in the bible even having a number by then that's a misprint but that's the way the lord does with this thing if there's a misprint in it he put it there for a reason and guess what 1093 brabeo is like i say in the dictionary they're all in the dictionary but i go to the lexicon and there it is. 
and it says Brabeo 1093 Rue Umpire Umpire Bingo Ump There it is and I look get used to this or you're going to miss something and umpire that's not supposed to be there in that lexicon is on page 1600 as in 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. That's the White House, okay? That was the Lord. Okay, this thing was printed up in 1994, 1995, a long time before Trump became president. And in his extreme sovereignty, T.R., his name is T.R., Trump, and it goes with T.R., and it goes with the hump, and there's this one verse with the word that means ump in the Bible, but they don't put a number by it, but of course it's in the dictionary, all of them are, but there it is, it's in the lexicon, and that's not supposed to happen, and it happens to be on page 1600, as in Pennsylvania Avenue. Well, I knew that was a, a God thing. This was about three years ago, somewhere around 2019, 2018. The Lord had spoken to me in 2015 that Trump would be elected and some stuff about it, May of 2015. But, so all that happened, and I've been amazed and stunned. I mean, that, that was a stunner. But, all right, so, I, my original Most Holy Bible is this one. It's epic, as my daughter says. It's awesome. But the pages were beginning to get a little frail. And they had another printing that had the same pages and everything, but just wider margins. And so I decided to take, you know, this is really sacred to me, my most valuable natural physical possession. I decided to, to put it away and actually keep it in my back seat in case I needed one. And get me a new one. I got me a new one with wider margins, same printing, same pages, same numbers, same everything. Just water margin. And that way, because see, I'm writing all these numbers. I'm writing a ton. You know, I'm, I've memorized over half the numbers that's in Hebrew there. I know what those numbers, I know what word those numbers mean. And I'm I'm filling it up and I got the water margin. I can put a lot more of them in there. So anyway, I got this, I call this the senior, my senior Bible, and I got a junior. I ordered it and I sent it off and had a hundred and fifty dollar cover put on it. The extra thick, genuine leather cover put on it down at Norris Publishing in Greenwood, Mississippi. But for whatever reason, the thing, the spine of that Bible, it wasn't turned, the pages weren't turning loose. The but the, I'm gonna show you a picture. The pages weren't turning loose, but the but the spine was caving in. And maybe you can see this. Here's a picture of that Bible. And it's actually got an ink pen lying in the, the, the spine is kind of caved in. Uh, I don't know if you can see that. Can they see that, you think? Yeah, the spine is caved in on that junior, what I call junior. That's the one I used every day. It's, it's caved in on that Bible, and which makes the pages pooch out like that. And, you know, uh, it's my second most valuable possession. And so I called them up at Norris Book Binding, and, and they said, uh, send it back to them. And so I, I sent it back to him on Tuesday, the 18th. And when I sent it off, I mailed it off. And I said, Barbara, I'm suspicious of God because he does so many crazy things that are so increase, and so crazily sovereign. I got a feeling he's going to show us something that's in the senior Bible that we wouldn't have got in that junior Bible. So the next morning was the night, yeah, October the 19th, I remember now. And so, so she said, she and I sit down at breakfast every morning and we rotate through the Psalms. And we have a system. So on October the 19th, every year, we read Psalm 109. So first morning with, with a, the old boy, the old senior Bible brought out of out of the moth balls and lay it out on my table and I open up to Psalm 109 and it, you talk about the hair standing up on the back of your neck. The hair on my whole body stood up when I looked down 
and realized what I was looking at. The, I'm getting goose pimples right now, just telling you this, because I am. I've I got goose pimples all over me. I turn to page 109, which is a very, very, very special psalm, and it has to do with the last chapters of, of Judges. That was a whole 2019 experience, understanding the last three chapters of Judges. I thought I understood them. But anyway, Psalm 109, it's about David cursing Saul, really, is what it comes down to. Psalm 109 is about David cursing Saul and the horse he rode in on. Otherwise, in Samuel, he does real good towards towards Saul, but in this in this psalm, he lets him have it. He curses him and his children and everything. But I'm going to show you this. It's on the board there, but I'm going to show you this in case you want to. If you got to record this right here, you can zoom on it and see it actually is there. And what it says is it's Psalm 109. Down there beside in the center column, there's a center column reference. This is page 710, which is upside down oil. <laughs> it's got upside down oil in that in Psalm 109, where David curses the oil, his oil. Page 710, upside down oil. And it, what it says is, it's in Psalm 109, the center column and senior most holy Bible. It says, 16 January 2016. 1,093.6 miles. And miles has got a little M on it. It's not my name. I don't even remember what trip. I made a trip apparently somewhere. And I don't know where it was. I can't remember. But I came. I must have came home on 16th of January, 2016, which kind of reminds me of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, by the way. And I saw my odometer at 1,093.6 miles. And that's about the oddest number I can, you can't imagine something more crazy, more odd, more random. That don't mean, I mean, it's not like 7777 or something like that. It's not like 1,000 or something even. It's not like 273 plus 3. It's not something like that. It's the weirdest number. It's, that's a nothing number. But obviously, the Holy Spirit spoke to me that, that Psalm 109, that, that 10936 was Psalm 109, verses 3 through 6. Because I wrote it there in my center column on the 16th of January, 2016, before Trump was ever elected. Long before I knew about T.R. Ump. Long before that. And for whatever reason, I wrote 16 January, 2016, 1,093.6 miles, and then I bracketed Psalm 109, verses 3 through 6. You see what I'm saying? 109, 3 through 6. I don't even remember that. I wish I did. I wish I was keeping better records. But there it is in black and white in the Most Holy Bible. And if I had mailed off my Bible a day later, I'd have been on the next page a day after, and I would have missed it. But I mailed off my Bible exactly right to open up the first day. And there this is. And these three verses, these five verses, three through six, say, does this sound like Donald Trump? With words of hatred, they surround me. They attack me without cause. In return for my friendship, they accuse me, but I'm a man of prayer. They repay me. Pray the evil for good and hatred for my friendship. Appoint an evil man to oppose him and let an accuser stand at his right hand. They are, they are carnally opposing him and he is carnally coming back at him. You know what I mean? He's, some of Trump's wounds are self-inflicted. David was, in, I believe, just... Solomon was in the flesh, but he wrote a whole lot of said what, a lot of what he said. In Ecclesiastes, just like Job was in the flesh when he railed against God and Satan when he spoke against God, they're in the flesh. But it's in the Bible to teach us something. And David wasn't supposed to curse. Look, he cursed Saul and all of his descendants. That's probably was trying to curse Paul, the apostle. He shouldn't have done that. Trump is being unrighteously persecuted 
but he's also responding in unrighteousness. And where this is going, I don't know. But that happened to me. God manipulating even my junior Bible, the spine caving in, and me having the impulse to send it back and get it fixed. And they're going to charge me. They're going to charge me $150 to fix a Bible. And I paid $150 for the original covenant five, cover five or six, seven years ago. Seven. Well, it's been hard. It's, been, it's known some hard use. But anyway, I don't care. It's precious beyond words to me. It's, it is like my baby. They said, well, do, have you been beating up this Bible? Are you... One of these people bend them and beat them like this and hold them upside down. And no, I treat it like a baby. <laughs> it's got a, that super thick leather cover. It's got a crease in it like it's about to break where my thumb goes when I carry it. I don't know. It's, it, I gave $150 for that thing, that cover. Besides, it was a virgin Bible. Anyway, God's in charge even of that. And of when I sent it off, and when I recorded, and you know what? I'm just trying to stay on this horse. I don't have a saddle. I don't have a bridle. I've just got a grip on the mane of this horse, and he's a runaway. And his name is, this runaway is named Yahweh, and I'm hanging on for dear life. And next time I see you, I'll give you an update, because I don't know more than what I've told you. Jesus, thank you, Lord. You pour into our laps more than we're able to receive sometimes. Help us, Lord, not to lose what you give us. Give us sideboards on our laps so we don't lose anything. In Jesus' name, amen. Whew.